Hello, congregation, family, and friends. I pray that all is well with you today. Thank you for joining me for this uh, Sunday message. Here's a $64,000 question for you. And we've all asked this. What is life all about? How can we define life? What does it really mean? What does it mean to, to fit into God's plan of creation for mankind? Where do we fit in? How can we understand our creator better? These are all questions I am sure, I, I know that I've asked many times through my life. And I'm sure you've asked it too, particularly the first one. What is life all about? Sometimes when we're discouraged or we're lost, we're mired in sickness or we have financial issues or whatever the case may be, we get mired down in things and we get exhausted. And maybe we might ask, oh, Lord, what is life all about? I mean, what does all of this mean? What does it mean? Well, I'm going to answer that question for you. Yes, I'm going to be bold enough to actually tell you what life is all about. And we're going to go to actually one particular place in Scripture. There's plenty of places we could go. But I'm going to give you three different uh, reasons of why life is so important and what life is all about. I'm going to give you three examples. We're in Psalm 8 today. We're going to look at the entire Psalm. This is one of the best known, most well-loved of all the Psalms, of all 150 Psalm 8. It's the Psalm of David. And we're going to look at that, and I'm going to show you three areas that clearly explain what life is all about. Because if you get confused sometimes like I do, and we lose our way, we lose our, lose our perspective, we need what I'm calling a different set of eyes. We need to look at things differently. We need to look at people differently, creation differently. We need to look at God differently. Because if we keep looking with the same eyes that we have now, we will never get past the mire that we've put ourselves in. The disappointments, the frustrations, the anguish, the anger. What we see, what we perceive is what fills our mind, ultimately it fills our heart. What we need is a different set of eyes, and David is going to provide that for us. So whether you're taking notes or if you have your Bible and you're following me along, we're in Psalm 8 today. And the first thing that I want to show you is this. Please notice in verse 1 and 9, these words. In verse 1, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Then go down to verse 9. It says the same thing. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Please notice that David begins and he ends this psalm with the exact same words. Now, I'm going to read verses 1 and 2 because I broke this down into three different sections. So let me read that, and then we'll go back and look at it. Verse 1 in its entirety. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. From the mouths of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. What is, what is David talking about here? Here's the first thing. Here's what life is all about. The most important example. Life is all about the majesty, the excellency, the awesomeness of God's name in all the earth. Did you hear me? Life is all about us recognizing, acknowledging God's excellence, his preeminence, his awesomeness, the majesty, the glory of God in all of the earth. That is the first thing that life is all about. We have a big problem. I have it sometimes, you have it sometimes, but by and large, the world has it. You know what the problem is? The problem is that we have lost the awesome vision of God that he is. We've lost his majesty. We've lost his glory. Yes, we can pray to God. Yes, we can worship God. Yes, we can give our first fruits to God, but I'm saying, have we ever considered that this God spoke the universe into being? Are you hearing me? He spoke it. Let there be light. Boom, there was light. Let the animals appear and so on. He is the great creator of the universe. We have lost that vision, that vision, that magnificent, that glory that God is. We've lost it. We've, we've gotten mired in our own way of looking at things. We are so far removed from the vision that God has given us that we've actually, we've settled for less inspired visions. You see, we see the world sometimes as corrupt. We see it as 
uh, dirty. We see it as bland. We, we see it as ugly. We sometimes can't find the good in life. We have trouble trusting each other. We do terrible things to the environment. We have taken God's magnificent creation that he gave to us. The crown jewel of his creation was mankind. We have taken that and we have lost that vision. Do you remember when, when uh, Moses wanted to see God and God said, you, no one can see my face and live. And what did he do? He put Moses in the cleft of a rock and then he went past the rock and Moses only saw just the tail end of God. And that glory was so much, it was overwhelming. When the glory of God used to come down into the tabernacle, the Shekinah glory would come down. When the mountains were, were full of his glory. This world is full of God's glory, regardless of what we think of it, regardless of how we treat it, regardless of what we see around us. We have lost the ability because we're blinded. We need a different set of eyes to see the majesty, the creation of God. We should be in awe of God. We should be on our knees thanking him for what he's doing. The very breath that I'm breathing right now, this technology that we're using to share this message right now, all of this came from God. All of this was created by God. And yet we get caught up in a world that doesn't see God's glory because there's so much ugliness around us. There's so much corruption. There's so much crime. And we get caught up in that. Do you understand that God is above all of that? God is above all of that. Why are we not seeing this? So you want to know what life is all about? Life is all about recognizing and taking into our hearts God's majesty, his magnificence, his excellence, his glory in all the earth. And that's what David is saying to us. He's saying, oh, Lord. Notice he's saying, oh, Lord, our Lord. It's a personal relationship. David had a personal relationship with the almighty God. God said he was a man after God's own heart. Are you a man or a woman after God's own heart today? Can you say that? Are you walking with that kind of faith? Are you walking with that kind of miraculous set of eyes that you're seeing what God has created all around us? He is the creator. He created this world for us to live in. And unless we understand and unless we see with a different set of eyes the magnificence of God, we cannot understand what life is all about. Can't do it. David was motivated by God's majesty. It was personal. He had a relationship with God. And he said, God, how excellent is your name in all the earth. There is no other name. There is nobody above God. There's no one more important than God. God created all this. And until we find a vision, until we see it with godly eyes, then we will be stuck in a boring, dark, crime-filled, ugly, corrupt world. And that's all we'll see. And that's all we'll see. And that's a shame because that is not what life is all about. How do we see what David saw? With a different set of eyes. With a different set of eyes. Let's look on to, to uh, verse 2 because it can be a little confusing. What is God saying here? He says, from the mouths of infants... And nursing babes, infants, meaning smaller children, nursing babes, suckling, those that are still being weaned. From the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you, God, you have established strength, a foundation, a foundation of praise, a foundation of acknowledgement of who God is. Because of your adversaries, your enemies, to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. Anyone who rises up against God is an enemy. Did you hear me? Anyone who rises up against God in any way is an enemy of God. And God has created such magnificence that it says here, because of your adversaries, those against you, to make the enemy and the revengeful cease, to stop. Think about this. You think about small children. Think about your childhood. I can think about mine. Children are not weighed down with sin as adults are doesn't mean they're not sinners. We're all born into sin. But do you remember what it was like as a child? You can, every day was a new discovery. Whether you went to school or you went outside or your parents were showing you something, you were, you were hungry for knowledge. You wanted to see what was around that corner or in the next room. You wanted to see how first, 
told maybe you could push your parents, how much you could tease them. But your world was full of wonder and curiosity. You were soaking in everything. The wonder was all around you when you saw a rainbow. It was a magnificent thing if you were a child. You saw the first rain, you heard the thunder, you saw the bright sunshine and you felt the heat on your skin. We have lost that. We have lost that because when it's too hot or it's too cold, we complain about it. Instead of saying, God, thank you for the sun, because if you didn't have the sun, this would be an iceberg, the entire planet. We wouldn't survive. And thank you for the cold, Lord, because it takes certain life down so that life can be renewed the next spring. Do we say that? Do we think about that? No. What we think about is it's too hot. It's too cold. I'm sitting in traffic. We have lost the sense of wonderment. If you're a young child and you're running around, you are curious about everything. And, and if you're like me, you ask your parents a thousand times, why? Why is this happening? Why is that happening? Why does the dog bark? Why is the sun so hot? Because we're curious. We're investigating. So a child, what he's saying here, a child has that sense of wonder about them. They, a child, whether they can express it or not, have more of the vision of God's excellence, of his creation, of his majesty, of the wonderment of creation. I submit to you that a small child has that more than any of us adults because a child has not been corrupted yet by the world to see the ugliness of the world. They see the wonder. They hear music. They see birds flying across the sky. They visit a zoo and they want to know what's the difference between an alligator and a crocodile. Do you see where I'm going with this? When we were children growing up, we had this enormous curiosity about everything. We've lost that. So the first thing that life is all about is to make sure that we know who God is and who, what he created. But there's more, of course. The second thing that we have to realize, life is all about the special place of significance that God has given mankind. Read with me verses 3 and 4 of Psalm 8. David said this, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him? What's, what is David saying here? Life is all about that special place, that special place of significance, I should say, that God has given to mankind. He says here, when I consider, when I think about it, when I see it, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, Lord, it's what God created. David is saying, when I see the work of your hands, your fingers, what you have done, the moon and the stars that you have ordained. When is the last time you actually looked at the moon or the stars or the sun and actually realized how magnificent that creation was? And if it wasn't balanced, imagine if we lived in a world that was sunny 24 hours a day and never got dark. Imagine a world that was 24 hours dark that never warmed up. God provided. God's creation is so magnificent. David is saying, when I consider your heavens, when I look up in there and I see the stars and I see the moon, when I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, Lord, you, you created all this, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. What does it mean ordained? You've established it. You directed it. You ordered it. You put it into place. The sun and the moon do not move. The earth rotates, but we don't go floating through the universe. God has established everything in its place, and he did it perfectly, and he did it exactly to the point where we can live here and live among his magnificent creation, and if we do things right, we can pretty much maintain our health if we do things right. So David is saying here, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have ordained, and then he asks this question, what is man? What is man that you take thought of him? What is man? He's talking about as he was originally created, as in Adam, that you even take thought of him, that God is mindful of us, that he blesses us, that he hears our prayers. What is man that you take thought of him? And the son of man, the son of man is simply all of the ancestors, all of us that have come from Adam, the son of man, that you care for him. Let me ask you this. Does God care for you? Does he provide for your needs? I'm not talking about your wants. Does he provide for your needs? Does God care enough about you to not only provide material possessions for you, but you know what? He provided something even greater. You know where I'm going with this. He provided his own son, 
Jesus to die on the cross to pay the price for your sins and my sins. And you know that's the biggest, best provision he could have ever done. Oh, we may be lacking in some things in this world. Not everybody has everything. But we've grown up in a world where we're spoiled. We want everything now. We want everything exactly the way we want it. And if God doesn't deliver, he's not God. We have taken God. And what we've done is we've taken God and we've moved him down to our level instead of us trying to raise up to his level. Did you hear me? We have made God a celestial puppet. We have made God someone that we can say something to him and pull his strings and we get instant miracles and instant cash and instant everything. And we're told over and over and over that we can have our best life now. We can have everything we want in this life. Just tell God what you want and it's done. Are you kidding me? God is above all of that. God gives the good gifts to whom he wants, when he wants, if he wants, and how he wants. That is God. And if we've lost that vision and we've also lost the significance of where man fits in there, with all of our corruption, with all of our sin, with all of our rebellion, David can still say, what is man that you thought of him and the son of man that you care for him? Can you honestly say that God doesn't care for you? Seriously? Can you honestly say that? See, another problem that we have is we have lost we have lost our sense of human significance. When's the last time that you, you just said, Lord, I am in awe of your creation. I am in awe of what you are doing in my life. How many times have we just kind of humbled down and got quiet and realized what God has been doing in our life? When's the last time that happened? Or are we so busy running around doing our own thing? filling our own agenda, being exhausted at the end of the day. And when it comes to the end of the day, we haven't thought about God. We haven't spent time in his word. We haven't prayed to him. We haven't talked to him. We haven't thanked him for getting us safely through the day, for everything that he provided. We have lost the sense of significance that God has given mankind. He loves us. He loves us enough that he gave his son, Jesus, to die for us. Do we just take God for granted? I think we do very often. When's the last time you really, really thought about how much God cares for you? That he even thinks about, it. listen, this is the God of the universe. And he's telling us here through David that he thinks and he cares about you. You. And he cares about me. God. Millions of people. Billions of people. All kinds of things happening in this universe that he needs to uphold and keep in order. And yet, he thinks about you. And he thinks about you. And he thinks about me. We have lost that sense of how important we are to God. See, we're important to ourselves. We think we're something. We think we're big shots and we're smart and we can figure everything out. Not on your life. We couldn't do anything without God. I couldn't be speaking to you because I'd have no breath if it wasn't for God. So we need to get back to a point where we understand that there's a significant part that man plays in God's creation. We are the jewel of his creation. He created the animals and the plants and everything else, and then he created mankind. How do we get back to that? God is with us at all times. He's in every part of creation. Every time we look around and we see something, God is right there. But we can only see this if we see it with a different set of eyes. We need to see it with spiritual eyes. We need to see it through the eyes of God, not the eyes of man. That's our problem. So the second area, if you're going to ask me, Thomas, what is life all about? Life, first of all, is all about recognizing and acknowledging God's magnificence, his creation, his majesty, and his excellence. Life, number two, life is all about understanding the role of significance that God has given mankind to play in this world. But there's a third one. Here's the third thing. Life is all about the stewardship or the responsibility that God has delegated to mankind. Life is all about being responsible for what God has given us in this life. Look at me, verses 5, 6, 7, and 8. Let's read that, Psalm 8. Yet you have made him a little lower than God. You crown him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. 
you have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, the beasts of the field, the birds of the heaven, the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the sea. What is he talking about here? We have been given a responsibility by God to take care of his creation. Everything is under our dominion. God, it says here, if we go back to verse 5, yet you, God, have made him, mankind, a little lower or just below the angels. Mankind is right below the angels in creation. We have God, we have the angels, we have man. So we're right below. We're not down here with the plants and the animals. We're here, right below. And it says that you crowned him with glory and majesty. See, it's not in and of ourselves. It's not your glory and majesty, and it's not mine. It's in Christ. Because Jesus was given to us. He was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, the Bible says. Which means God already had this plan of redemption in place before mankind ever sinned and rebelled against God. And so he's saying, you are crowned with glory and majesty, not in ourself. In spite of our rebellion and our sin, God is still blessing us with Jesus and the free gift of salvation. That's what David's talking about here. You've made him a little lower than God, but you crown him with glory and majesty. Verse 6, you make him to rule over the works of your hands, to rule over. Do you remember in Genesis 1.26, what did it say? That everything was subjected. To man. Remember, God said you have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds in the air and the beasts of the fields and all the creeping things that creep upon the earth. That has never changed. God has been given the command by God to be a good steward of what God has put here on the earth. That's what he's talking about. The works of his hands. That's just big saying everything that God created, everything that he created here. Man is responsible for all of it. Now look at this, look at this list. Sheep, oxen, beasts of the field, birds of the air, fish of the sea, whatever passes through the, the, the uh, path of the sea. Now look, let's be honest here. Here's the truth. We, mankind, we have failed in how God wanted us and instructed us to be good stewards of what he's given us here on earth. We have failed in it. Man, by and large, we've abandoned God's way of doing things, and we do things our own way. We think we know better. We have chosen to live in this world in a cesspool of sin, degradation, rebellion. We have ruined our natural resources, okay? We've polluted the air. We've polluted the water. We have landfills with garbage everywhere in this world. We have destroyed animal life. There are, and there are strains of animals that are extinct. They're gone, never to return. What have we done to take care of God's creation? And so when we look at it, all of us need to take responsibility. Every time you throw a piece of trash out the car window, every time you dump something into the water that doesn't belong there, every time you mistreat an animal and it dies of suffering because you can't take care of it, every one of these things God is watching He's listening, he's watching, and I'm telling you, he is not happy with us. It's one thing if we want to destroy ourselves, we want to kill each other, we want to uh, plot things against one another, we want to have affairs, and all the mess that humans do. But what happens one day when we wake up and there's no clean water, and there's no more animals to eat? And all of the food is poison. You see it now, more and more recalls of food. More and more people getting sick. Why? We're not taking care of what God has given us. And so if you ask me, Thomas, what is life all about? I will tell you three things. Number one, it is God's majesty. It's getting a sense of his majesty and his creation and the fact that God is way up here. And we better reverence him and we better honor him and we better understand who he is. He doesn't work for us. We work for God. Number two, life is all about the special significance that he's given man. In spite of the fact that we have failed him, we have rebelled against him over and over again. You can read it through the Gospels. You can read it through the whole Old Testament. All we do is rebel against God, and yet he still loved us enough to send Jesus to the cross to pay for those sins of all those who would come to believe on Jesus. And the third thing, the third thing that life is all about, 
is understanding that God gave us a responsibility to take care of his world. And once again, we have failed miserably. We have failed. But then, if you ask me, okay, is that what life is all about? Yes. The magnificence of God, the importance of man, and taking care of the resources that he gave us. If you look at those three things, that's what life is all about. Everything else is secondary. So let me ask you this. What do you think life would be like if you had these three things? A new, fresh, compelling vision of God's glory and his majesty. I mean a fresh vision, a new sense of awe, a new sense of wonder. What would your life be like? Number two, what would your life be like if you had a renewed sense of human significance? If you understood your role that you play in this world and how God loves you and how he gave his son for you and how he wants a relationship with us, how better would your life be? And third, what would your life be like if you had a sense of renewed stewardship and responsibility? So the next time you thought about throwing trash where it doesn't belong or polluting the air where it doesn't belong or throwing something into the water or whatever you do to help destroy God's earth, even if you're killing animals, if you're a trophy hunter, shame on you, personal opinion. But if you are ruining God's creation, suppose you had a renewed sense of that. Suppose you suddenly realized around you the magnificent creation and you could appreciate a tree and a breath of fresh air, and that stream is going down. And you could go out into the woods and you can hear and see God's creation all around you. What if you had that renewed sense? How different would your life be if you had those three things? See, only God can give us a different set of eyes. Only Jesus can restore us to a sense of significance. And only Jesus can lift us out of sin and decay to a place of stewardship. Only God can do that. I can't open your eyes. You can't open your eyes. But I'll tell you what we need. All of us need a different set of eyes. All of us need to see our eyes, not through us, but we need to see God's creation, our place in it, and the resources he's given us through a different set of eyes. You know what they are? They're called the eyes of Jesus. If we see everything through his eyes, I guarantee you, your life would change. My life would change. The quality of this life in this world would change. If we had that, could you imagine a worldwide revival of people recognizing God first, then man, how important he is, and then, and then taking care of the resources that God gave us. Imagine things like hunger being wiped out, diseases being curtailed. Imagine murder rates going way down. Imagine churches being filled with people in love with God because they recognize who God is. That's not what we have in the world now. We don't have that. We have churches that are three-quarters empty that are closing. Every day, churches are closing. Pastors are leaving the pastorates. We have crime. We have all kinds of things, and we've done it to ourselves. God didn't want this for us. He showed us in this psalm. Let's go back. Verse 1 and verse 9. We're going to end with this. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. If that could only be our prayer, if that could only be the main focus that we have every single day, if we could only realize that God comes first, everything in our life would change. Everything. I pray that this message has been a blessing to you. If it has, please feel free to share it. God said in Isaiah 55, he said, my word will not return void. It will reach those he intends it to reach. Did it reach you today? Did you hear something today? Were you convicted of something today? I hope that you were. Please share it with someone else who needs to hear this message. The other thing I would ask of you is this. My church family hears it all the time. Be a Berean. Acts 17, 11 says the Bereans were more noble than other people. They weren't better. They weren't smarter. They weren't brighter. They were more noble. And you know why? Because they searched the scriptures every single day to make sure that what they were hearing was the truth. I encourage you to do the same thing. Take this message, anything you hear from any preacher, Bible teacher, etc., anyone you watch on TV, listen to on the radio, internet, any church you go to, you owe it to yourself to make sure that what you're hearing is true. Because there's a lot of bad teaching out there. There's a lot of bad things that are being taught that simply are not biblical. So be a Berean. 
Finally, stop by and see us on our website, livinginharmonyministries.org. We've got a lot of things going on. This is a ministry that God has raised up, not only for individuals, but for church bodies as well. We're busy serving the Lord, and we have many different services that we can offer. Stop by and see us, livinginharmonyministries.org. If you feel led to support us, we're grateful for that. If not, we part friends. If you can't, uh, if, if something on the website can't help you, that's okay. Share the website with someone else. We just want people to know that we're, we're out here. We're serving the body of Christ. So I thank you for joining me for this message. I pray that you were blessed. Thanks for watching.